But you never loved someone But you never loved somebody like I just did But you always hurt the ones Hurt the ones you say you're so deep in love with You don't know nothing, 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 nothing You don't know what it feels like Baby, I'm hurting, 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 hurting And you don't even ask why Something from you that feels right She must know how to cook No food She must know how to set her table attractively She must know how to make her home comfortable and inviting Warning this story contains extremely heavy themes. You should probably expect that by now, but I'm warning you up front. The details on this one are tough, but they do not involve children. Omaima was an Egyptian immigrant who came to the United States when she was just 18 years old. She had the intelligence, and she certainly had the looks, but her pursuit of the American dream ended in a cruel American nightmare. This is the story of how a beautiful, intelligent, and damaged woman devolved into a life of sugar daddies, misery, and eventually, devastating murder. I'm Mr. Black, and this is The Disturbing Truth. Omaima was born in 1968 near the Sudanese border in southern Egypt. She was raised in a rural area rooted in extreme poverty. Omaima grew up in a relentlessly volatile household. Her father was an abusive man who was cruel and sexually deviant to both his wife and children. In her youth, she was forced to undergo female genital mutilation which, as you can probably imagine, made intercourse unbearable and uncomfortable for the rest of her life. FGM, as it's called, is a traumatic and barbaric procedure that involves the use of primitive tools to remove the parts of female anatomy that stimulate sexual satisfaction. This is often done without any anesthetics, and this horrible act was performed on Omaima when she was only seven years old. Eventually, Omaima's mother gathered up the courage to leave Omaima's cruel father. She took her family and relocated to the City of the Dead, a ghetto in Cairo surrounded by graveyards. Contradictory to its name, the City of the Dead used to be a peaceful area, but in recent times, it has expanded into one of Cairo's largest and most dilapidated slums. The actual population of those who live in the city is unknown. However, it's estimated that there are over one million people residing there, rubbing shoulders, united in despair. Omaima, for a time, was one of them. Despite a rocky start in life, there's no denying that Omaima physically blossomed. She was stunning. Then when she was 18, she met and fell in love with an oil worker from the United States. Omaima's family pushed her to get married, and of course, the young woman consented without hesitation. Omaima and the American wed in 1986, and then she moved to the state of Texas to be with him. But it was happily never after, as the rushed marriage swiftly fell apart for unknown reasons. Omaima, still just 18, was now alone in America, low on funds, and possessed little knowledge of the English language. She decided her best option for potential stability was to meet men in bars. As a matter of fact, it was her only option, other than heading back to Cairo. But Omaima wasn't even going to consider that. So, she kept on keeping on. She didn't really have many job abilities, but she scraped by as a nanny, maid, and other odd jobs that paid cash in hand for work. Omaima's beauty eventually led to her being employed as a part-time model, and this helped pay the rent for a bit. But after a while, she got sick of relying solely on her appearance to land a few one-time beauty jobs, so she started looking for other ways to secure some income. Then at some point, Omaima's means to earn took a criminal turn. 
She had a series of relationships with men for the purpose of defrauding them of money. She'd do this over and over, going from man to man and town to town. As it escalated, she began to bind up her unsuspecting victims and threaten them with a shotgun while robbing them. Her ex-boyfriend, Robert Hansen, could tell you exactly what it's like staring down the double barrel of Omaima's wrath while tied to a chair. As soon as Omaima got what she wanted, she was gone, spending the money and looking for her next victim. She was cold, brave, and brutal, but she sure as shit didn't appear to be losing any sleep over her actions. The disturbing truth will continue in a moment. As someone who makes true crime content for a living, you'd think that when I'm not producing it, I'd stick on something lighter and fluffier to watch, but to be honest, that couldn't be further from the disturbing truth. I can never get enough true crime content because every case I go over educates me further, giving me a better edge on upcoming cases. That's why I'm proud to have this video sponsored by Magellan TV. Magellan TV is a streaming service that was founded by filmmakers and just so happens to have more true crime documentaries than any other platform like itself. Not only that, but their true crime category contains a bunch of cases that I'd never heard of. With 15 to 20 hours of new, strictly ad-free content added weekly, I doubt you're gonna run out of stuff to watch on Magellan TV. For instance, lately I've been watching Scotland's Murder Mysteries, which depicts the country's most notorious solved and unsolved crimes, and it does so in an educational fashion using crime experts and actual evidence dissected by legal professionals. Couple this with on-point dramatization of the story, and you got a true crime series that's guaranteed to get your wheels turning. Outside of that, I'd recommend Crimes That Made History, Murder in Paradise, which is about the two backpackers that were killed in Thailand, Price of Honor, about honor killings in Texas, and then finally, The Last Confession of the Cannibal. Pretty dark stuff. But remember, it's not just true crime on Magellan TV. They've got packed categories like history, science, space, travel, and more. Magellan TV is simply ad-free documentaries on demand that you can watch anywhere. TV, laptop, tablet, phone, and the app's compatible with Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, Google Play, and even iOS, so you can take it on the go. Plus, annual memberships are on the low side, costing only $59.88 or $4.99 a month, and that gives you access to over 3,500 hours of quality documentaries. Hey, they're sponsoring me, and I love that. I love their service, so if you want to check them out, Magellan TV are offering the Disturbing Truth followers one month absolutely free. All you gotta do is click the link in the description and pinned comment down below. Welcome back to the Disturbing Truth. In 1991, at the age of 23, Omaima eventually made her way west to Orange County, California, where she met her ultimate target, Bill Nelson. The pair met while playing pool in a bar. Bill was a 56-year-old Texan, and a big one at that, standing 6 foot 4 inches and weighing around 230 pounds. He was a former pilot who got fired after he was convicted of smuggling marijuana and electronics to or from Mexico. He ended up spending some time in federal prison for his crimes too. But even with at least one felony conviction, Bill was known as a decent guy with plenty of people willing to vouch for his character in the name of civility. After Bill got out of jail, he too headed out to Orange County in search of a new life and even managed to bag himself a job at a mortgage company. He liked to brag about all the land he owned in Texas and was fond of flashing a bit of cash here and there to get what he wanted. Bill was also the father of five children and the grandfather of 17 grandkids. Omaima was drawn to older men for a variety of reasons, one being that she believed they would treat her better. I'd also imagine they were prone to have a little more wealth and I'm sure Omaima liked that too. Once she knew Bill Nelson was the proud owner of a red Corvette, I imagine she thought she hit the jackpot. Bill was wearing red cowboy boots the night they met. His colorful big character ran parallel to the huge belt buckle he donned like it was some form of clearance. Bill told Omaima that he owned a huge cattle ranch in Texas. Omaima wanted to be taken care of and it seemed like Bill Nelson was her type, an older man with supply. The new lovers clicked right away and were so enamored with one another that they tied the knot just a month after meeting. They weren't interested in making wedding plans or wasting time. 
They had a telephone ceremony conducted by an Egyptian priest and then apparently drove straight to Phoenix where they found a justice of peace and made it all official. Next, the newlyweds took a road trip to Texas and Arkansas for their honeymoon, during which Bill introduced Omaima to his family. She was seen to be a tough, no-nonsense type of character. She even suffered a nasty fall off a horse on the trip. It was bad enough that everyone thought she should seek medical attention, but word is she took some aspirin, sank some vodka, and kept right on going. One of Bill's daughters even said, that gal is one tough cookie. After a few weeks on the road, flying high on new love, the couple returned to Bill's apartment in Costa Mesa to get settled in and begin a fresh new life together. Bill even called his daughter Margaret around this time to tell her how well everything was going between him and his new wife. He was gearing up for the couple's first Thanksgiving feast and it seemed life just couldn't be going any better. Bill asked his daughter to join them, but Margaret declined the invite, and that was the last time she ever spoke to her father. The mirage of Wonderful began to quickly dissolve on December 1st of 1991, when a man named Jose Esquivel was shaken awake in the early hours of the morning to the sound of a frantic banging on his door. Confused and still coming around to himself, Jose thought it best to look out the window first. There was no one there, but he did spot a parked red Corvette that he'd never seen before. With an uneasy feeling about the situation and, I'm sure, wanting to be careful, Jose decided not to answer the late night knocker pounding on his door. Later that same day at around 1 p.m., the red Corvette returned. The driver again knocked on Jose's door, and this time he answered. It was Omaima. He didn't know her that well, but he had briefly dated her about a year previously. He was surprised to see her standing there, but she was bawling her eyes out, showing him cuts she had sustained to her face and hands. She alleged that her husband had forced himself on her, beaten her, and kept her captive for days at a time. She claimed she was able to free one of her arms, grab a nearby lamp, and beat Bill Nelson to death. She swore this through tears, in the name of self-defense. Omaima also revealed to Jose that she had dismembered Bill's body and put him in trash bags. She said she needed some sort of truck or vehicle to assist her in disposing of the remains. Omaima offered Jose $75,000 and two motorcycles in exchange for his assistance. Jose agreed and told Omaima to wait for him at Bill's apartment while he went to get his truck. But Jose wasn't stupid. As soon as she left, he called 911 and reported Omaima's grim confession to the cops. The police found Bill's car with his new wife in it, and they began questioning Omaima immediately. But she denied ever having told Jose anything. She claimed that Bill was simply in Florida on a business trip. But while Omaima seemed cooperative, the answers she gave when questioned were a little bizarre and even contradicting at times. But what happened next raised the bizarre bar to a whole new level. Officers discovered a suitcase in the car containing human organs. Omaima swore the human remains were from someone Bill had killed. Among the body parts was a set of lungs with black spots on them. An investigator said that meant the victim was a smoker. Bill was also a smoker. They weren't 100% sure it was him yet, but at that point, they knew they were dealing with a homicide. And as gruesome as it already was, I don't think they were prepared for what they were about to discover. It was easy enough for the police to get a warrant to search Mr. Nelson's apartment, and that's where they found a number of horrific things. First, there were suitcases. The suitcases were lined with trash bags, and the trash bags were full of more human body parts. Then in the bedroom of Bill's apartment, the mattress was dripping with blood. Each one of the four bedposts were broken too, indicating some kind of struggle. Then the cops discovered a broken lamp and an iron, both of which contained blood, human tissue, and hair. But after that, shit really hit the fan. The bathroom was bad, and 
I mean, everything from here on out is bad. So just brace yourself. In the bathroom of Bill Nelson's apartment, suspended above the bathtub, hanging from coat hangers, still bleeding out, was Bill's hollow torso. He had been skinned. I told you it was bad. But then there was the kitchen. And the kitchen was something else. Human hands were found in frying pans, fried together in oil with pieces of white turkey meat. They found pieces of hip in the trash too, with other pieces of turkey and cranberry sauce. And then when they looked in the freezer, at first, they thought it was loaded with bags of frozen vegetables. But when they removed the bags at the front, they found a large round object covered in tinfoil. After unwrapping the tinfoil, they realized it was Bill's head. And to their horror, it had been deep fried. This had all happened three days prior, on Thanksgiving Day. Omaima had claimed she had been held captive by Bill, yet investigators found that he was the one with the marks around his ankles, like he'd been shackled. They weren't sure about his wrists because, well, they couldn't tell due to the injuries they'd sustained. And when Omaima took the R test and it came back negative, people really started getting suspicious. But finally, after medical examiners stated that the wounds and the bruises they examined on Omaima's bodies were wounds she'd sustained while, well, cutting something up, she was quickly brought in for questioning and presented with a massive pile of evidence stacked against and, at that point, towering over her. After talking as if Bill was still alive for a while, Omaima knew she was caught and gradually began to reveal more information. She claimed she had no memory of killing Bill. She said she woke up and found him in the trash bags. She claimed it was demons or something inside her that told her to do what she did. She even said she had a vision of two blood-covered women that repeatedly told her that Bill had to die. So, she killed him. But if you ask me, she more than killed him. As investigators reassembled Bill's body, they discovered more grim details about what really happened to him. It was determined that he died as a result of at least 25 different head wounds. They believe Bill and Omaima had a consensual bondage roleplay session going on in the bedroom, and that's when she convinced Bill to let her tie him up. The cutting of the body was completed with such accuracy that the coroner's office wondered if it was Omaima's first time. Was it possible that she'd done it before? And then when they weighed the human remains and it didn't match the weight on Bill's driver's license, they did some simple addition. Somewhere between 80 and 100 pounds of Bill Nelson was missing. A neighbor reported hearing the garbage disposal running from within the apartment the whole weekend until it finally broke, but investigators began to wonder if Omaima had actually eaten pieces of her new husband. Any beauty credit to Omaima at this stage was being badly outshadowed. Good looks weren't getting her out of this. After her arrest, authorities discovered a pattern of behavior in Omaima's fast-moving past, from the sugar daddies and robberies, to even an instance where Omaima had been previously arrested for shoplifting at pharmacies. Another time, she was stopped by two female security guards in the process of stealing from a department store. When approached... Omaima reportedly snapped and nearly bit off the breast of one of the women. Then when she went for the other one's crotch, she was able to free herself, fleeing for a short time before being captured again. The 24-year-old was put on trial for the murder of Bill Nelson on December 2nd of 1992. During the trial, the prosecution called her ex-boyfriend Robert Hansen to the stand. He testified about how she chained him to the bed one night before producing a revolver and demanding he hand over all his money. Luckily for him, he was able to break from his confines and take the gun off Omaima. But he didn't contact the cops because he felt humiliated. He was embarrassed that she got one over on him. And so, charges were never pressed. The deputy public defender depicted Omaima as a victim who turned on her abuser. He reiterated that his client was innocent, 
but the deputy district attorney, on the other hand, said she was a predator who was planning to flee the area with Bill's money, credit cards, and his fancy car after she killed him. The trial was marked by gruesome testimony of the horrific details. Omaima told the jury that she stabbed and beat her new husband to death to prevent him from hurting her again. She claimed she freaked out after and went into a trance-like state after the killing. She said she spent 12 hours chopping up the body to make it easier to dispose of. Chopping and cutting sounds were also heard throughout the night coming from inside Bill Nelson's apartment. She also admitted to cooking Bill's hands in order to remove his fingerprints. And she came clean and told them about how she mixed his body parts in with leftover Thanksgiving Day turkey and threw it in the trash. Then to top it all off, Bill Nelson was also castrated in another cold act of sheer brutality. Some of this torture probably happened while Bill was alive, and there are rumors that she was planning on feeding Bill to his family. This woman was absolutely evil. Omaima Nelson's psychiatrist classified her as psychotic. His statements painted an even darker glimpse into the mind of Omaima and just how deeply disturbed she truly was. She claimed that during the night-long dissection, she dressed up in a red hat, red high heel shoes, and crimson lipstick as a part of a ritual. In Egyptian mythology, the warrior goddess for Upper Egypt is depicted as a lioness huntress with a bloodlust. She's often portrayed as a woman with the head of a lioness. She dresses in the color of blood. Omaima claims she started to believe she was descended from ancient Egyptians. She claimed that they communicated with her and acted on her behalf. Despite the lack of any evidence of an assault on Omaima herself, her defense utilized a forensic psychologist to assert that Bill had actually molested her. He was said to have demanded oral sex from her on a daily basis. Apparently, this was coupled by demeaning name-calling. Omaima said Bill would get angry if she didn't follow his instructions. This is what they say apparently drove her insane to the point of believing that ancient Egyptians were aiding her by instructing her to dismember Bill's body and scatter it so he'd be unable to enter the afterlife. She wanted to make sure Bill wouldn't be waiting for her in heaven. But if such a place exists, I don't think that's where she's going. But one of the most shocking parts of this story is that Omaima claimed she prepared Bill's ribs in a restaurant-style manner, stating, and I quote, It was so sweet. She elaborated further, I only eat the parts with muscles, particularly thighs and calves, which are my favorite. I make a very tasty stew with the tongue, and I use the eyes to make a nutritious and healthy soup. Omaima's attorney testified in court about a lifetime of alleged abuse. He claimed she showed evidence of PTSD and described how practically everyone in her family had either beaten, tormented, or assaulted her in one way or another. When Omaima took the stand, she told the court how her husband screamed, I bought you and I'm getting what I paid for, before he forced himself on her. And she claims that was just one of the multiple times in which he did so. Omaima said she stabbed Bill with the scissors, then grabbed an iron and other weapons to complete his demise. During the trial, Omaima Nelson's assistance was requested in tracking down some missing evidence. The court stated, We're missing about 130 pounds of Bill. You know where he might have gone? Omaima replied, No, he was all there. She swore to God that she never ate any of Bill and that she's not a monster. She said Bill had been handcuffing her to chairs regularly and even threw her cat out the window of the car once. She also said Bill threatened to bury her body out in the desert during their road trip if she didn't comply with all of his demands. However, she was convicted of second-degree murder by the jury. Despite their sympathy for Omaima, the eight-woman, four-man jury did not accept her allegations about an abusive relationship with her and William E. Nelson, who was 56 when he was murdered during Thanksgiving weekend in 1991 in the Costa Mesa condominium in California. Despite the extensive mutilation of the body, the jury in Orange County Superior Court acquitted Omaima of first-degree murder after deliberating for six days and concluding there was insufficient evidence to prove the slaying was premeditated. Miss Nelson was sentenced to 27 years in jail for second-degree murder 
as well as assault, false imprisonment, and robbery of a former boyfriend, according to the Orange County Register. Omaima apologized for dismembering Bill Nelson, stating, I was in a life-or-death situation. I would have been killed that day if I hadn't slain him. She was denied parole in both 2006 and 2011, but she still maintains that she murdered her husband in self-defense. At the parole hearing, Bill's daughter Margaret Nelson spoke. According to the Los Angeles Times, she took a few moments to gather herself before reading a written statement about not being able to introduce her father to her eight-week-old daughter. Margaret finished by saying, I don't know the adequate punishment for a murderer who doesn't even leave a family a body to mourn over, but I do know you don't let her out. You're damn right, Margaret. Don't even consider it. Omaima remarried in prison in the 90s. The disabled man was in his 70s and has since passed away. But he and Omaima reportedly had three-day conjugal visits, even with knives sitting out in the kitchen. Omaima said he never felt threatened or endangered in any way. She claims she really loved him. Aww. Whoever that man was is fucking mental. Of course, he apparently left her a large sum of money. Omaima will be eligible for parole when she's 58. That will be in 2026. And I'm sure it's not hard to believe that she has a whole following of deranged people that worship her like the god she thinks she is. But underneath the surface beauty on the outside of Omaima is nothing more than the rotting flesh of a cold-blooded monster. Another man-made demon, like her soul had been plucked from her body when she was only a child and replaced with a succubus that should never, ever re-enter society. She might have been a looker, but her eyes are empty, and she is heartless. While I feel for the innocence of the child that used to inhabit the body of Omaima Nelson, in my opinion, she's barely even human anymore, and you will never fix her. Letting people like this out of prison is a sign of madness. Omaima currently resides in Central California Women's Facility in Chowchilla, where she serves time next to other high-profile criminals such as Louise Turpin, both of which who can rot in hell. Rest in peace, William Bill E. Nelson. I'm Mr. Black, and this is the disturbing truth. <laughs>